Hello and welcome back. My name is William and in today's video we're going to start tackling the topic of trees. In particular, we're going to look at what trees are and how we computationally store and represent trees. Conceptually, it's fair to say that most people know what I mean when I say that I'm working with a tree or that something is structured as a tree. Below are four graphs, but one of them is not a tree. Do you know which one? Only the last graph is not a tree, but why is it not a tree? That's because we define a tree as being an undirected graph with no cycles. And that's the key thing to remember, a tree cannot have cycles. You can see that the rightmost graph has a cycle and is therefore not a tree. However, there's an even easier way to check whether a graph is a tree or not. Each tree has exactly n nodes and n minus 1 edges. If we count up all the nodes and edges of each graph, you can see that all the trees have one less edge than the number of nodes, that is, except for the rightmost graph, which is not a tree. All right, now we know what trees are, but where do they appear in computer science and in the real world? Let me give you a few examples of where you might encounter trees. First is your computer's file system, which consists of directories, subdirectories, and files, which is inherently a tree. Another place you see trees manifest themselves is in social hierarchies, where you often see CEOs, kings, priests, and generals at the top, and interns, peasants, children, and the lower class at the bottom. Trees are also used to decompose source code and mathematical expressions into what are called abstract syntax trees for easy evaluation. For example, the math expression on this slide can be broken down into a tree structure. Every web page you visit can be thought of as a tree due to HTML's nested tag structure. This tag structure is used to tell your browser exactly how to render a web page and how it should be displayed. Another large application of trees is in game theory to model decisions and courses of action. On this slide is the famous prisoner's dilemma problem and its four outcomes for whether each prisoner chooses to confess or to defect. There are many, many more applications of trees in computer science and in the real world, but we're not going to cover them all today. However, it's worth mentioning that in computer science, the place that you will most often encounter trees is probably as part of data structures, many of which are listed on this slide. All right, now we need to talk about how we actually store and represent undirected trees on a computer. First, you should label all the nodes of your tree by indexing them from 0 to n non-inclusive, like the tree on the left of this slide. A very simple way to store a tree is as an edge list, which is simply a list of undirected edges indicating which two nodes have an edge between them. The great thing about this representation is that it's super fast to iterate over and quite cheap to store. The downside, however, is that storing your tree as a list lacks the structure to efficiently query all the neighbors of a node. This is why the adjacency list is usually a more popular option to represent a tree. In this representation, you store a mapping between a node to all its neighbors. For example, node 4 has the neighbors 1, 5, and 8. So in the adjacency list, node 4 maps to the list containing 1, 5, and 8, respectively. You can also store a tree as an adjacency matrix of size n by n, where having a 1 in a particular cell means that the nodes corresponding to the row column values have an edge between them. However, in practice, I would say to always avoid storing a tree as an adjacency matrix because it's a huge, huge waste of space. You would not ever want to allocate n squared memory and only use roughly 2n of the matrix cells. It just doesn't make sense. 
All right, I can't keep talking about trees without mentioning rooted trees, which are trees which have a designated root node. I have highlighted the root node in orange, and most rooted trees you'll notice have directed edges which point away from the root node. However, it's also possible for edges to point towards the root node, but these trees are much rarer from my experience. Generally speaking, rooted trees are far easier to work with than undirected trees because of their well-defined structure, which allows for easy recursive algorithm implementations. Related to rooted trees are binary trees, which are trees for which every node has at most two child nodes. The first two trees on this slide are binary trees, but the last one is not because it has a node which has more than two child nodes. You don't often see binary trees manifest themselves in the real world. For the most part, binary trees are artificially created and integrated as part of data structures by computer scientists to guarantee efficient insertions, removals, and access to data. Now related to binary trees are binary search trees, which are trees which satisfy the binary search tree invariant. The binary search tree invariant states that for every node x, the values in the left subtree are less than or equal to x, and that the values in the right subtree are greater than or equal to x. This nice little property enables you to quickly search through the tree and retrieve the values you want, which is particularly handy. All the trees on this slide are binary search trees, except for the last one, which is not a binary search tree because one is not greater than or equal to three. It's often useful to require uniqueness on the values of your binary search tree so that you don't end up with duplicate values in your tree. To resolve this issue of duplicate values, you can change the invariant to be strictly less than rather than less than or equal to. Now let's talk about how we store rooted trees. Rooted trees are naturally defined recursively in a top-down manner. In practice, you always maintain a pointer reference to the root node of a tree so that you can access the tree and all its contents. Then each node also has a list of all its children, which are also called child nodes. In this slide, the orange node is the current node we have a reference to, and the purple nodes are all its children. All the bottom or leaf nodes of the tree do not have any children. It's also sometimes useful to maintain a pointer to a node's parent node in case you need to traverse up the tree. This effectively makes edges in your tree bidirectional. Again, if the current node is the orange node, then the pink node, in this case, is the parent node of the orange node. However, maintaining an explicit reference to the parent node isn't usually necessary because you can access a node's parent on a recursive function's callback as you pop frames off the stack. Another really neat way of storing a rooted tree, if it is a binary tree, is as a flattened array. In the flattened array representation, each node has an assigned index position based on where it is in the tree. The thing to understand here is that the tree is actually an array. The diagrams are just a visual representation of what the tree looks like. For instance, the node with a value five in orange is associated with the index four in this array. Similarly, this node with a value of two has an index of six. Even nodes which aren't currently present have an index because they can be mapped to a unique position in the index tree, as I call it. In this format, the root node is always at index zero in the array so you always know where your starting point is. Another advantage to this format is that the child nodes of node i can be accessed relative to the position of node i. For example, if we're at position two in the array, we know that the left and the right children of the node at index two is given by two times i plus one and two times i plus two. Therefore, the children of the node at index two can be found at positions five and six. 
Reciprocally, this means that if we have a node, we know what the index of its parent node should be, which is also very useful. All right, that's all for this video. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe if you learned something, and I'll see you in the next one.